Hi guys, and welcome to chapter 10 of Infectious Diseases. This is part 2 on antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. Now let me start with a story about Alexander Fleming. Now this is a guy who went to med school and was a certified doctor. And what he did was he researched on a particular bacteria that caused a deadly disease. Um, but he was quite callous and left the petri dishes overnight um, in the lab without cleaning them. But he was very lucky because when he came back, he found a mole that killed the bacteria he was researching on. And after further research, they found that the mole actually produced an antibiotic called penicillin. At the time, they didn't have the term antibiotic yet. They just found this compound called penicillin and they tested it and used it on sick mice and it worked. And therefore, they died and uh, their co-workers died, but their work uh, and their contribution to science caused many others to survive. Ta -da! End of story. Now, disclaimer, I did not make this comic strip. It is quite silly and I thought it was quite funny. Anyways, coming to the idea of antibiotics, penicillin is just one of the many types of antibiotics. Now, let's define it and see what it does. Now, antibiotics are drugs used, and they're usually derived from microorganisms. Some are mold or fungus, but some can be from other microorganisms as well. Now, antibiotics kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria without harming the infected organism. This is very important, isn't it? If you, if you want to eat the medicine, you want to make sure that the medicine actually kills the bacteria and not you. Now, there are two types of antibiotics here. There is bactericidal antibiotics, which are antibiotics that kill bacteria, and bacteriostatic antibiotics, which inhibit bacterial growth. So antibiotics don't necessarily kill bacteria, a little typo there. It, it is a drug that can kill a bacteria or inhibit bacterial growth. Now, it only works on bacteria. It prevents spread on bacteria within the body, it is harmless to human cells again, and has no effect on viruses. It does not affect viruses. Now, let's see how it works. Now, we all learn a lot of things about bacteria, and this is the part here where you should recall. Now, when we want to use a drug against bacteria, we want to target things that the bacteria has, but we do not have, so that it does not have harm, cause harm upon us. Okay, so we can inhibit cell wall synthesis. We don't have cell wall, bacteria has cell wall, so if we inhibit that, then we will cause it to not grow that fast or kill it. We can inhibit activity of a specific membrane protein or glycoprotein that the bacteria has, but we do not have, and this blocks binding to cell maybe, and then it can block entry into our cells and therefore block the action of bacteria. Now, it also can block specific enzyme actions, and this enzyme again are specific towards bacteria, which is not specific towards us. Okay. And of course, we can use antibiotics to inhibit protein synthesis and nucleic acid of bacteria. Now, their machinery is slightly different from ours. So, um, by targeting that, we won't cause harm to the human, but we can cause harm to the bacteria. So, um, this is just a list of many ways that antibiotics can act, by the way. Many different antibiotics out there, and each of those antibiotics will have different mechanisms. Now, let's look at penicillin and how it works in particular. This is something you should know, and you should know for the exams as well. Now, in the absence of penicillin, um, this is what happens. So, you know the bacterial cell wall is made out of peptidoglycans. We learned this in chapter one. And peptidoglycans is actually uh, made out of sugar and amino acids. Now, when the bacteria cells grow, what happens is it wants to expand in size. So, it secretes autolysins. And autolysins actually make tiny holes to allow the cell wall to stretch. After stretching, new peptidoglycans can be formed across those tiny holes, but that's not done yet. You do need to have reinforcements after you make holes. You form crosslinks um, by peptido, pe sorry, peptidase enzyme from crosslinks between peptidoglycan chains, and this reinforces the cell wall once again. And right now, the bacteria is bigger in size. 
Okay, so it's sort of like making a hole, making a hole bigger, patching it up, and then making cross links to make sure it's reinforced. Sort of like a patchwork. Now, what happens in the presence of penicillin? Now, what penicillin does is that it inhibits the peptidase enzyme. So it inhibits the formation of cross links between peptidoglycan polymers in the cell wall. So the cell can make tiny, tiny holes. Okay, autolysins can make tiny holes to allow the cell to stretch. And they have like holes now. And then new bacteriolipins can be formed, but it cannot be linked up, it cannot be reinforced. And therefore, it results in a very weak cell wall. And therefore, when water diffuses into the bacteria by osmosis, the cell walls will be unable to withstand turbo pressure. And the bacterial cells can lyse and die. Ta -da. So penicillin actually is a bacterial cidal antibiotic because it causes the bacteria to be killed, not just inhibit its growth. Now, of course, it's only effective when the bacteria is trying to grow. If the bacteria is very slow growing, like in TB, then there would, this penicillin wouldn't be so effective. So that's why different antibiotics are effective against different bacteria. Penicillin is not suitable for TB, but TB has other antibiotics that might be suitable that uses different ways to um, to combat that. Now, how do we find out what is effective towards the particular bacteria? Now, so this is what can happen in the lab. So, um, put, so this is called a spread plate method. Um, if we are lucky, we'll get to do this, uh, but I don't think so since we have so much NCO and lab works for limited, but we'll see. We'll see what happens next year, okay? Anyways, um, yeah, so you can put some bacteria on a uh, agar plate. Agar plate is uh, something like agar agar but with some nutrients for the bacteria to grow. You spread the sample of the bacteria evenly and you incubate it. And usually you will get these surface colonies, uh, a little bit of dots and like a blood surface like this all over. But what you can do in addition to that is to put a few discs. Now this disc could be made out of filter paper or like little absorbent paper sort of thing, soak it in some antibiotics and then place it there before you put it to grow and incubate. Incubate means to put under a certain temperature for a certain time. Usually um, for bacteria we use around 40 degrees. So put the this there, incubate it and you will see that hey there would be a zone of inhibition form. So let's say this is antibiotic A, antibiotic B, and antibiotic C. Uh, we can see here after the growth time of 24 hours, um, the bigger the zone of inhibition, the more effective that particular antibiotic is towards the bacteria. So for example, this is a random bacteria, maybe E. coli. Now, we can see here among A, B, and C, antibiotic C is the most effective towards it. The bigger the zone of inhibition, that means this area of growth, means the more effective it is. Now you can look at this real life example here. We can't see the different letters. Um, it's not very visible here. But we can see that this particular antibiotic disc here has, has the biggest zone of um, inhibition, the largest diameter. Okay, usually we'll measure in mm, never measure in cm. Okay, so measure in mm and we realize that it is the most effective. We repeat this another five times at least according to CIE standards and we know that hey, this one here must be the most effective. So that's that. Now, Let's talk a little bit more about antibiotics and why doesn't it affect viruses? Now, viruses have, again, a very simple structure. It has inside a nucleic acid with a DNA RNA, outside that a protein coat, and right outside that an envelope and many glycoproteins, sometimes called spikes. Now, antibiotics do not affect viruses, like penicillin, right? Antibiotics like penicillin cannot affect viruses because viruses do not have a peptidoglycan cell wall. Instead, they have a protein coat and therefore the drugs don't work against them. Also, they do not have their own metabolism, so they don't have a lot of enzymes for us to act on. They have, there are no processes happening in 
in the virus itself, but it relies only on host cells. There's not even a lot of cell structure to work on, only very few organelles. So very, um, I don't think they have much organelles at all, really. So there are very few sites for antibiotic to act on. And also, in the body, when you are having the virus, the viruses live inside your whole cells out of reach of the antibiotics. And therefore, it is very hard for us to use antibiotics to treat viruses, and also very hard for us to produce antivirus. This usual, antivirals usually only target the viral glycoproteins on the viral lipid envelope. And you can imagine because on the, on the surface, there's only that few particular targets um, and that target glycoproteins can change in appearance and time. And we'll see that particularly next chapter on why is it so hard to combat viruses such as HIV. So in conclusion here, the point here is antibiotics do not affect viruses because of all these reasons. And even antivirals are very hard to produce because there's not a lot of target sites. Now, let's talk about antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is when antibiotics are no longer effective against bacteria. And antibiotic resistance can be spread from bacteria to bacteria. For example, for penicillin, many bacteria has developed penicillinase enzyme that can break it down. And therefore, those bacteria become resistant to penicillin. And of course, they also pass this penicillin enzyme, the gene coding for penicillin enzyme, to other bacteria. We'll see the specific mechanism in a while. Now, what is antibiotic resistance caused by? Now, it's caused by the first thing is random mutation in bacteria. And random mutation, as you know, in the part where we talk about mutation, it causes change in protein pro or production of new protein that cannot be targeted by antibiotics. Mutation results in new alleles. New alleles mean that there is a change in mRNA, change in protein, and therefore it might not be specific to be targeted by that particular antibiotic anymore. Now that's mutation. A mutation, after mutations, natural selection actually enables resistance genes to spread. Antibiotic is the selection pressure here. Antibiotics only kill the bacteria that are non-resistant. So kill the bacteria that's non-resistant, and then only the resistant bacteria can survive and reproduce. And therefore, the surviving bacteria is all drug-resistant bacteria, all antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And the antibiotic-resistant gene can spread to the next generation or other bacteria. Now, antibiotic-resistant genes are usually found in class meats, okay, small circular DNA that is found in the bacteria. Now, this can be spread Okay, these genes can be spread using vertical transmission, so the bacteria divides by binding fission and pass it down to the daughter cells, or can pass by horizontal transmission and pass to other bacteria, even different species of bacteria, by conjugation. So using the pili and then replicating the plasmid and transferring the plasmid into the other bacterium here. The, the specific mechanisms don't need to be known. Now, you can imagine how crazy antibiotic resistance can spread also because not only that the bacteria is replicating and transferring the gene, uh, we are also transferring it to them. For example, um, George gets antibiotics and develops resistance. It can stay at home. It can spread to at home. If, he's, he, it gets, if George gets care at a nursing home or hospital, resistance germs can spread to other patients or other um, healthcare workers, and these patients and these healthcare workers go home. So it would spread among the community. Now what if it happens to animals? So animals also can inject it with antibiotics, you know, they, you know that they do, <clears throat> to protect them from diseases, and they also can develop resistant bacteria in their guts, for example. Now, this drug-resistant bacteria can remain on meat, and then we eat the meat, and therefore it spread. Or their feces can contain drug-resistant bacteria and that is used on food crops. 
and then we eat those crops and therefore tada, antibiotic resistance spreads amidst the human community. So yeah, this is a big picture of what's going on. So what is the cause really here and why? Do, how do we speed up the spread of antibiotic resistance? We speed up the, the progress of antibiotic resistance when we do not complete the course of antibiotics given by the doctor. Because when we do not do that, the treatment may not be completed. So some susceptible bacteria survive and more time uh, is given for it to replicate. And as it replicates, there's an increased chance of mutation and becoming resistant. So it's important to kill all the bacteria that's susceptible all at one go and quick. Now the consequences of all these um, antibiotic resistance and spreading is that bacteria can carry not only one but several antibiotic resistant genes over time and this is the concerning bit. If it's resistant to one antibiotic, never mind, we can use another. But if they do not, then they can develop multiple resistance. Okay, So if bacteria not only gain resistance to one antibiotic but several, we cannot use many antibiotics against that bacteria. And this is what we call a superbug. For example, um, Staphylococcus aureus is a particular bacteria and it's um, methicillin resistant. Methicillin is one of the highest, most powerful sort of antibiotics around. And even um, this, this bacteria is even resistant to it. And, and what happens in patients which have MRSA or are infected by MRSA is that wounds do not heal and are continually infected with bacteria. So you can imagine a lot of pus, a lot of not healing, and the wound will be open continually. And yeah, it is just a nightmare. Um, in serious cases, they can cause limbs to be amputated. Now, these bacteria with multiple resistance, not only MRSA, cannot be killed and inhibited by common antibiotics anymore and need to continually be controlled by stronger antibiotics. But there's only so many antibiotics that we have at the moment. So what is the solution? Now, number one, we need to discover more new antibiotics and fast. We can maybe take a known antibiotic and slightly alter and modify the chemical structure to produce a new antibiotic and see if it works from there. Discovery takes a lot of time and, and um, you know, from discovery to clinical um, testing and to drug in the market, it takes around 10 years on average. You know this because, see, the vaccine also takes time. Even if we found the vaccine, we need to test it, right, for COVID. So, yeah, it takes a lot of time. So, the best solution right now is prevention. Now, what can you do? You can only use antibiotics when prescribed by a certified health professional, you must always take the full um, pre prescription, always finish the course of antibiotics, even if you feel better, never use leftover antibiotics in your cupboard, never share antibiotics with others, and prevent infections by usually regularly washing your hands, avoiding contact with sick people, and just maintaining good hygiene in general. And that's it. That's it for antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. These are things you need to know. You need to know about penicillin and how it works. Why doesn't it work on viruses? And of course, the cause, consequences, and prevention of antibiotic resistance. And that's it for this chapter. Have a good time break. Bye.